Hey, so Pastor Trisha gave an amazing, powerful message last week on faith and the power of faith, right? So I was talking to her this week, and I really felt like I needed a, to share on faith. And I said to her, Pastor Trisha, the Lord is telling me to, to preach on faith again. And she looked at me. She was like, well, good, because I was going to do a part two to, to the whole teaching of faith. So it was just confirmation that we're just going to drive this thing home. We're going to drive faith home. And it's not beating a dead horse. We can never hear much enough of it. So, uh, But for me, this walk of faith started, I'd say, when I was about 12 years old. And I've shared some of this from the pulpit, but for the first 12 years of my life, my, my father, now I have a wonderful father. He's a godly man. And even when he wasn't walking with the Lord, he was, he was a good dad. As, with what he was equipped, right, to father me with. But the first 12 years of his life, of my life, he wasn't walking with the Lord. And uh, things got a little hairy in the house and the family. And, and it, you know, whatever was going on in the marriage, as a young, as a young boy, I was, I was seen. And I was, I was aware of what was happening. And, and I'll never forget the day that my father submitted his life to Jesus. I'll never forget that. Because I saw a transformation in him that it changed his life. More importantly, it changed the marriage. It changed his children. And it changed the household. Okay? See, the importance of the father serving the Lord, statistically, they say that it's like 80% higher chance that your children are going to walk with God if the father is leading, if the father is the priest in the home. And that's just fact. That's statistic. So when my father changed, when my father was transformed by the spirit of God, there was a seed of faith that was planted in me. Because I had a revelation, wow, look what God did and, and, and God is real. And then I was raised in the church through, through my teen years. I mean, I I eventually fell into rebellion and all throughout my 20s. Again, I'm not going to, this isn't about my, my testimony, but there were seeds of faith that were planted in me at a young age. And eventually, when I was 29, 30 years old, somebody else came along and watered those seeds. See, the word of God says that one, plant, one man plants and the other man waters, right? And sometimes those seeds could stay dormant in there for 20 years. And, and that was the situation with me. That was the case with me. So I'm saying all this is because every single one of you guys, under the sound of my voice, have planted seeds. As believers, we're, we're farmers sowing seed. We sow seed into our loved ones, into our jobs, into other things and other people. We sow seed with our giving, right? And so be encouraged. If you have sown seed, you've done your job. Because, right? again, the word of God says that one man plants and the other man waters. Eventually, if you sown seed into your children, eventually the Lord's going to bring somebody along that's going to water that seed. And that thing's going to take root and it's going to begin to grow. But it was the seed of faith that was planted in me at a young age that is growing and it is still growing. So I thank God for that. And so faith is a seed. Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So to assume that you could please God outside of faith is to assume that you're on a similar playing ground, a similar level as he is. Because faith is really putting all your trust and dependence on him. That's what faith is. is You're fully trusting him in everything you have. Fully dependent on him. And if without, without faith, that's saying that you could do this on your own. Also, he operates through our faith. It pleases him to, that we have faith because he moves through our faith. See, people get healed through our faith. And he wants you healed, correct? A, life without, a Christian life without faith is, is just checking boxes. It's just checking a box. It's, it's good behavior. It's acting how you, you know you're supposed to act like, right? Who, who here, I mean, maybe I'm just preaching to myself, right? <laughs> Listen, 
A life without deep faith in the Lord is just wearing a mask. We're not called to wear the mask, right? I have a lot of scripture, and I don't. I hope this goes the way I, I thought it would go. <laughs> I just have a lot of notes here. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence. Amen. Father, I pray that you would just touch everyone individually, Lord. As I share, let, let it be your words. Speak through me, Father. Amen. Amen. James 2.26 says, For the body without the spirit is dead. So faith without works is dead also. Faith without works is dead. So listen, works, what James is saying is that it, it works, works are necessary, but also faith, it's got to be rooted and, and grounded in, in our faith, right? Luke 18, 8 says, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith here on earth? So Jesus' main desire, what Jesus wants to see is that we have faith in him. Amen? Amen? Everything branches from our faith in him. Everything happens when we have faith in him. Through our faith, we love him. Think about that. Through our faith in him, we're able to love him. Through our faith, we are healed. Through our faith, we are transformed. Through our faith, we are delivered and set free. Through our life, we could live out our purpose and destiny in him. It's got to be rooted and grounded in faith. He wants us to live by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. Everything we do is surrendered to him, is fully trusted in him. Every decision we make, you may think, oh, man, he's being, he's being really extra. But every decision we make, how we live, how we interact, how we minister, it's done through faith and faith in him alone. I'm not, see, we, every decision we make, it's got to be by faith. And again, I'm going to say that this verse, we walk by faith and not by sight. Listen, I've talked to enough people that have made decisions that really didn't make sense, right, to me as they're telling me. And they've done this and, and you know, they're saying, well, it's, it's, it's that Abraham anointed and, and anointing. And yes, that Abraham anointing is a real thing, but there's also wisdom in faith. You know, and just making decisions sometimes it, where it really isn't the Lord. Are, are we really in faith or are we making decisions based on emotions or, or other things that, that we may feel or woundings or offenses? You know, I, I, so it, it's easy for me to say, hey, we make decisions, we, we hear the Lord, we act in faith. But there is a, there is a wisdom, there is a, a revelation in our faith that we need to operate in also. Okay, I'm not saying to, 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 not to do the Abraham thing, right? He may call you into that Abraham thing where you just go, right? And you go in trusting him, not knowing where you're going to go. But sometimes that's not the case. You get yourself in a bind, right? And uh, we make irrational decisions. So please make sure that it's him. Please make sure that you hear the voice of the Lord. Right? Again, I'm going to say it again. There is wisdom in our faith. We need to operate in wisdom. So this is what I hear the Lord saying. I wrote it down. He wants to increase in us the anointing in how we move in faith with the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That's what I heard the Lord say Friday. I'll say it again. He wants to increase in us the anointing in how we move in faith with the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now, divine wisdom, right? To have wisdom is to have knowledge or experience in something that could only come from God. Remember I said we're going to move in wisdom and revelation. So wisdom is knowledge, divine knowledge from God. It's experience through the spirit of God. Now, revelation, we know what revelation is, right? It's to have your eyes open to something that has already been there. What am I saying? How many times have we read the word of God, let's say Matthew 5, right, reading through the Beatitudes, and we've read it over and over and over again, and now in this season in your life, you read it and something else unlocks, something is open in that portion of scripture that you've never seen before. 
That is a fresh revelation. It's always been there. It's always been the truth and the reality. But the Lord is revealing it to you through his spirit. That's revelation. That's fresh revelation. So we're moving in wisdom and revelation. Now, what is faith? Hebrews 11.1. 1. Joe, could I have that water? Thank you. You have Hebrews 11.1 1 there? All right. I have three different translations here. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Evidence of things not seen. The NASB says, now faith is the certainty of things hoped for. Think about that. The certainty of things hoped for, a proof of things not seen. And the ESV is now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. So, faith isn't just a belief in something. But, see, belief is, is good. Belief is good, but, but faith is, is, is much more profound. You're going a lot deeper when you say you have faith in something because there's a substance to faith. There is an evidence in our faith. There is a certainty in things in our faith. There is an assurance in our faith. Faith is a literal substance, right, that we are hoping for. That, what does that even mean? It's, actu- it's evidence of things that we can't see. So, listen, this is a supernatural, right? It's the evidence of things unseen. So, now we're talking about seeing into another realm that seen with our spiritual eyes that we cannot see with our natural eyes. But there's evidence there because we could see it in the spirit realm. Okay, the, the things unseen through our faith will be seen and they will be manifested through faith. Jesus had perfect faith. He has perfect faith. He is perfect faith. He is the author and perfecter, the author and finisher of our faith. So Jesus, let me say this. Jesus was not surprised when blind Bartimaeus got healed. He wasn't surprised. He, he, it wasn't like he prayed for him and did his thing and then it's just like, okay, good. He got healed. No, because he had faith. He had an assurance, right? He, there was something tangible that he knew. He saw the unseen and he knew that blind Bartimaeus was going to be healed. It, church, I'm saying this and I'm, I'm sharing this because it's, it's, it's time to step into this level of faith, this deep uh, upgrade in our faith. That we have the insurance, the certainty of the things unseen, they will be seen. They will be seen with our own eyes. The manifestation of the things unseen through our faith. Exodus 15. The Lord is referred to as Jehovah Rapha. Okay, and I'm going to talk about healing here because there's a lot of people in here that need healing, right? So Jehovah Rapha is the God who heals. The God who cures. The God who restores. See, Jesus knew, obviously, Jesus was God, and he had a certainty and an assurance of who he was. Right? So at him acting as Jehovah Rapha, there's no question. There's a certainty in his faith. Right? There's an, the, the truth about who he was was that he was Rapha and he was healer. In Mark 5, the woman with the issue of blood. So we know, we've heard this story a million times. I love, it's actually one of my favorite stories in, in, in the Gospels. Because she was a social outcast, right? And we know that, you know, in those times, she was unclean. So she would have been put out of society and put out of the town. And, and she was looked down upon. And it says that she spent for her funds on, on, on doctors trying to get herself healed. So who knows? She probably was living in poverty on the outskirts of town, looked on upon as a social outcast, right? And, and she was about to do something, right, in reaching for his garment that would probably get her stoned. They would probably get her killed because of how society worked back then. 
Okay? Think about that. In verse 28, 5, 28, It says, for she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. See, there was something in her. There was a certainty of the thing that is hoped for. Okay, there was an assurance of the thing that is hoped for in her heart. There was a conviction of the things that had not yet been seen in her. There was a level of faith that said, if only I could touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. And she was going to go to whatever whatever measure to touch the hem of his garment because she knew that the, the assurance, the certainty, the level of faith was there. Are you tracking with me, church? It didn't matter what was going to happen because she knew she was going to be healed. She was able to see the unseen, the level of faith that she operated in. Listen, I love the scene. Jesus was walking into the town. And there were probably hundreds of people around him bumping him and, and, and trying to reach and trying to grasp at him. And they were touching him. And, and his, his disciples were around him. And, and again, it must have been, he, at this point, he was already a celebrity, right? His, he, he wasn't a celebrity. You know what I mean. But he was, he was, he was popular. I, I don't want to show irreverence to Jesus, but he, he was popular, right? People, people sought him out. When they, when they heard he was coming into town, he drew crowds, right? And so this scene, there, there was hundreds of people around him, and they're all touching him. The woman with the issue of blood didn't even touch his body. And he's walking, and all of a sudden he stops, and he says, who touched me? Who touched me? And the disciples are looking at him like he's crazy. Rabbi, rabbi, teacher, everybody's touching you. What are you talking about? But the level of faith that this woman had, the certainty, the assurance of the unseen, of what is hoped for, it actually, it drew virtue and it drew power from Jesus. I want that faith. The certainty of what is hoped for. There's a difference between belief and and radical faith. A lot of people believe in God. Church, it's time to start. It's time to step into this place of radical faith. Of seeing the unseen. Of coming in agreement and alignment with what the Lord is doing and what he's saying. Verse 34 says, and he said to her, daughter, he looked after he stopped. She's like, it was me. I was the one who drew that. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Not even his faith. Her faith. Her faith has made her well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. I have a lot in here with different portions where Where Jesus says, your faith has made you well. In Luke 17, with the ten lepers that got healed, in verse 11, it says, now it happened. I don't think I gave this to you, Reyes. In verse 11, it says, now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar Remember, they were lepers, they were unclean. They had to stay afar on the outside. They were outsiders. How many know that the Lord wants to draw in the outsiders? Through healing, through signs and wonders, through his love. So these ten men, they were outsiders. They stood afar. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, go, show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that they went and they were cleansed. Eventually, you know, I'm going to skip down to 19. Only one of them came back. Only one of them came back. And that's a lesson in itself. And how we glorify and how we acknowledge the works that he does in our life. And how we show him reverence, right? And Jesus said to the one, 
He said to him, arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. His faith. That desperation of the ten calling, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. There was an assurance of what was hoped for. They were certain. They were certain that what they were hoping for would manifest if they could just only have an encounter with Jesus. In Luke 7, the Roman centurion, I'm going to read a little bit. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. See, this Roman centurion, he had, a, he had a level of faith that Jesus said, I've never even seen this level of faith in all of Israel. And he wasn't even, he wasn't even a Jew. He was a Gentile. I think Jesus is addressing the religious spirit here a little bit. He said, say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to the other, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel I have found such faith. I tell you, this, this man, this Roman centurion, he said, I don't even need you to go touch her and lay hands on her. I just need you just to say the words. And I am certain that this thing that I am hoping for will manifest. The certainty of things hoped for. I am sure that the thing I am hoping for will manifest. That's what he's saying here. Don't even go lay hands. Just say the word. I'm a man of authority. I understand the authority that you carry. I've seen it already. I've seen the unseen. It's faith. That's radical faith, church. It's radical faith. There was this conviction in this Roman centurion that said, if I could just talk to him, if I could just have a conversation with him, he would do it and he would say it and it would be done. Luke 18, blind Bartimaeus. I mentioned it before, but I'm going to read it. You guys all right if I read the story? I got a little time. A blind man receives sight is the title. Then it happened as he was coming near Jericho that a certain blind man sat by the road begging. And hearing a multitude passing, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing. So you hear the, the name was already there. And he cried out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You see, he was declaring who he was, too. In his cry of faith, there was a declaration here. He was, he was declaring that he was the Messiah. People don't realize that because the son of David is the Messiah. Right? So Bartimaeus had a revelation. He was already seeing the unseen. He was operating in a radical faith. Son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. I'm going to repeat this. You're going to get tired of me saying it. Bartimaeus had a certainty of what he was hoping for. That's why he was calling out so desperate for Jesus to come and encounter him. Because that encounter, he knew that if he had an encounter with Jesus, that he'd be healed. That's the level of faith. Listen. Listen. Jesus isn't here walking on this earth in the natural. But we can encounter Jesus at this level right now. We did this morning. You could do it in your prayer room. You could do it, at, you could do it in your car. You could have radical, supernatural encounters with the Spirit of God. Jesus. It's his desire. It's his hope for us. He's calling us into this place, church. Radical faith. Bartimaeus was a man of radical faith. His cry of desperation. There was a substance of what was hoped for that he knew was there. 39 says, then 
those who went before, warned him that he should be quiet. Could you imagine? They're telling him to stop and to shut up. What does he do? He yells louder. See, in this life, there may be people that will try to shut you up. In this life, there may be people that may try to stop you from being radical or bring shame or question you or talk about you, right? Are we okay with being radical? Are we okay with looking radical to the world, right? No, they're, they're saying, be quiet, shut up. You have nothing to do with him. Man, they'll call you foolish. I've been called a fool. Pastor Peter will always say, whose fool are you? I'm a fool for Jesus. Whose fool are you? <laughs> They'll try to shut you down. Let's be foolish for Jesus. Why not? Right? 40 says, so Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. All right, so now, like, they, now they bring him, right? Now Jesus is like, this guy wants an encounter. You bring him to me. Right? That's where Jesus will meet us. Right? As long as we stay, as we reject what, 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 what they're saying, and we, we want to encounter him, he will encounter us. And when he had come near, he asked him, saying, what do you want me to do for you? That's it. Sometimes that's, that's what it takes, just really speaking it out, right? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. At this point, it was already done. Because Jesus, we know Jesus was in agreement and in alignment with his healing. He spoke it out. He had radical faith. He asked for it. It was done. Then Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, went, and all the people when they saw him, when they saw it, gave praise to him. Praise God. Praise God. It's a gift of faith that I feel like we're going to really step into. Right, 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the, the actual, when it's talking about the, the, the gifts of the Spirit, there's a gift of faith that is imparted. Hey, why can't we have that gift of faith? Right, the word says you have not because you ask not. Who here has asked for that gift of faith? To operate in a real gift of faith. Not just faith, right, not just belief system, right, but a gift of radical supernatural faith that we are certain of the things we're hoping for will manifest as long as we step in it and it's in alignment with the Father's will. Right? I want that gift of faith, and we'll pray. James 5 says, If anyone is sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. 15, and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. The prayer of faith will save the sick. The prayer of faith will save the sick. It doesn't say the prayer of fear. Okay, I'm talking to myself now. It doesn't say the prayer of uncertainty. It doesn't say the prayer of worry, right? Talking to myself, not, not anybody else here. It says the prayer of faith will save the sick. And all too many times, we pray out of fear. We pray out of concern or we pray out of worry, right? Or we pray for our situation because we see it's not going well. We pray for our finances because we're worried that we're not where we need to be rather than praying from this place of faith rather than praying with this certainty of the things hoped for with the assurance of things not seen you guys tired of me saying that yet <laughs> faith is the substance of what is hoped for the evidence of the unseen so we don't pray by fear. We pray with hope. We pray with the word of God in our mouths. We pray with wisdom. We pray through revelation. And that's what faith is. It's complete trust and confidence that what we're praying for is going to manifest. Complete trust. Complete confidence. 
right? Despite the situation. So Jesus never prayed a, fear, a prayer out of fear or uncertainty. And when I, when I thought that, I, made that, I had that thought. Jesus never prayed a prayer out of fear or, or uncertainty. The first thing that came to my mind was the prayer that he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Because some people may say, ah, well, he was really struggling then. Right? Let, me, let me just say this. This was a prayer of surrender and coming into alignment and complete faith with the Lord and the will of the Father. Right? He says, oh, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but thy will be done. So this little portion, if this cup, let this cup pass from me, was just his humanity, right? The, the part of humanity in him. But he was in complete faith, in complete alignment, in complete surrender, right? And in wisdom and revelation, he knew what was happening, okay? Let me say this. If, if, if you're all praying for your kids, right, to come home to the Lord, pray in complete confidence, Pray in complete confidence and trust that they are coming home. It's not, it, it, yes, we are asking the Lord and we're coming in agreement. But listen, faith, the prayer, the faith, right, will, will make this thing manifest, okay? Never out of fear. You pray out of the promise of God. You pray as for, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You declare that, right? You speak that over your children, in faith and trust and confidence that, that it's going to manifest, right? Why? Because you know their purpose, right? You, you know the destiny of, of your children. You know the destiny of, of whoever you're believing the Lord for, right? How do you know the destiny? Through wisdom and revelation, right? Through, through, through seeing the unseen. It's time we, we, we operate in, in this realm where we hear the Spirit of God and we begin to pray this thing out, what we hear the Spirit of the Lord saying. And that's, that's prophecy, right? I love Karen Wheaton. You remember when Karen Wheaton was here in the other building? She's from the ramp, very powerful minister. She has a testimony of her daughter, Lindsay, where, when her daughter, Lindsay, was in rebellion. And uh, it was years. It was maybe two or three years that she was in full-out rebellion. And Karen, she gives her testimony on, on the stage. And she's saying how she would pray for her daughter. And she, she would pray every day for three loaves of bread. And she was praying out of Matthew 7, which says, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Okay, so she was asking the Lord for this bread that her, the, the three loaves of bread she was asking for was that her, her daughter would be healed. Okay, that she was praying for her salvation and she was praying for her deliverance. And this was a daily thing that she was praying for these loaves of bread, declaring, like, I'm your daughter. You're not going to give me a stone. You're going to give me this bread. Okay, now this was, this was a level of revelation that she had. But one day she said she was in worship and prayer, and she found herself in a vision. And in the vision, she says she stepped through a door, and then she found herself in this gigantic warehouse. And the warehouse had very high ceilings, and she said all the racking, all along the walls, there was bread. It was a, it was a warehouse of bread, and there was unlimited bread. And then she heard the voice of the Lord say, are you sure you only want three loaves? <laughs> okay. The Lord was showing her the unseen realm. And so her prayers changed from that. There was a revelation. She gained wisdom, knowledge of the unseen realm. And, and the level of faith was increased in her. Eventually, we had Lindsay here testifying just, just last year or a year and a half ago, right, uh, of her testimony. But the Lord showed her this vision. It was, it was in, in what shifted in her, like now she was certain of what she was hoping for would manifest. She was sure it would manifest because the level of faith, it, she, it just, it's amazing, right? So her prayers were like... <clears throat> 
she would call her friend and she would say, hey, did you hear the news? And, and, and Lindsay hadn't even come back home yet, but she's, hey, did you hear the news? Lindsay, Lindsay repented. She's back with the Lord, and, and, or Lindsay's preaching. And, and so she was actually, in her prayer, she was making declarations of what hadn't manifested yet, of the unseen, right? There was this, the conviction of the unseen. She was speaking it in the level of faith, and it happened. It really did. So when we pray, well, for whatever it is, we pray excited prayers. We pray excited because we have hope, right? They're prayers of hope because you can see what has not manifested yet. That's the thing. What are we seeing in the spirit realm? That's very important. We never pray out of fear, church. Never pray out of fear. Fear is false evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. And, I mean, the enemy uses fear to keep us out of faith. Fear is actually the opposite of faith. Right? The enemy will use fear to keep us out of faith. And I know, trust me, I know, I, I, was, I used to be bound by fear. Fear could be crippling. I was a slave to fear. Why do I say slave? Because it's, it actually controlled me. The fear in my life controlled what I did or what I didn't do. So you're a slave to that thing. You're a slave to fear if, 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 if it controls you. Thank God that by the power of the blood of Jesus, I broke free from that thing. I got set free from fear. I took authority over it. I bound it. I, I treated it like it was an entity, right? Because the word of God says the Lord has not given me a spirit of fear, but a spirit of po a love, po po power, love, and a sound mind. Right? So that fear is a spirit. It's not just an emotion. So when that spirit of fear is on you, you have the authority to, to speak to it and command it to go. Right? We know this, church. Am I, hopefully I'm just reviewing. Yeah, so you speak to that thing. You speak to that spirit of fear. You bind it. You take authority over it, and it has to go. It really does. The Lord has not given you a spirit of fear. He's given you a spirit of power, spirit of love. Spirit of sound mind, right? So fear is the opposite of faith. I have so many notes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, go ahead a little bit. <clears throat> I just want to share a story with, with, with my experience with fear and stepping into, I believe that that gift of faith has, has operated in my life many times, but this particular time, was when my wife was uh, newly pregnant from our daughter Abigail, and the first ultrasound that came that they did for Abby, they found some issues with her heart, and then they did another ultrasound, and it was more issues with her heart, and we did like three or four ultrasounds, and they sent us to a specialist, a heart specialist for the ultrasound, whatever it was, and. And they were saying, this, this isn't looking good. We can't figure out what's going on. And the first thing that rose up inside of me was, oh, no. Right? As, as, as a father, my little girl is not going not gonna to live or she's not going to have a, a normal life. And, and fear tried to rise up in me. Fear tried to keep me in a place where I was crippled and almost like come in agreement and in alignment with that diagnosis. Right? I mean, who, who, come on. I'm, I know, I know we've experienced this. So that, that spirit of fear will try to grip you and try to keep you bound. And the second you fall, fall into that thing, right, now you're given that diagnosis power. But I remember praying. I remember this faith rising up in me and said, listen, we're not, and I told the doctor this, we're not going to agree with this diagnosis. And I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and so I felt this gift of faith raise, rise up in me, and there was a certainty in me that my little girl was going to be okay. I was sure of it. I'm telling you, there's just something that, you know when you pray and you feel something shift in the spirit? And, and something shifted in me because of that faith, the assurance of what is hoped for, right, that, that it, it manifested in the next time we went to the doctor. And they didn't find anything wrong with her. And a lot, of, you all see my daughter. She's a perfect, beautiful little girl. 
It's amazing. So listen, that fear, you bind it, you take authority over it, and you let that gift of faith rise up in you. Church, we got to be people of radical faith. Radical faith. We can't lay down to the enemy. The only thing, the only person we should fear is, is the Lord. Proverbs 9, 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. See, I've used that word wisdom, knowledge, revelation all, many times in this, in this sermon, right? But they're good with the fear of the Lord. I'll read it again. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So the only one we ought to fear is God himself, God the Father. I'm telling you. Remember what I said before. He wants to increase in us the anointing in how we move in faith with the spirit of wisdom and revelation. I'm going to end with this, and then we'll pray. Proverbs 3. This is faith right here, church. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. All your heart. Not some of your heart. Even that little dark place in your heart, that little, you know, I've often, I had a vision one time that I saw somebody's heart and it was a house with many rooms in it. And most of those rooms, the doors of it were, were swung open and the lights were on and there were lamps in it and, and, and everything was on and everything was clean and everything was fresh. But there was one closet in that big house of many rooms that was locked and the lights were off. Okay, that was a piece of that person's heart that wasn't open to the Lord. And when I released that word over that person, it was just like, how did you know? <laughs> right, it was, it, was, it was a word, and I was able to minister to that person, and, and, and they were able to open that part of their heart up to the Lord and receive healing and deliverance. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, on your own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. That means his thoughts are above our thoughts. His ways are above our ways. When we try to lean on our understanding, we try to figure it out and we get in trouble. In all your ways, acknowledge him. That means in everything you do, have faith in him. That's what that sentence is saying. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Everything you do, have faith. Walk by faith. You live by faith. You acknowledge the Lord. You surrender to him. And he shall direct your path. Can we just stand up? Father, we thank you for your spirit that is here today. God, I just ask right now that you would stir us up. Stir us up, God, to walk in this radical faith that we see here in your word. Like the woman with the issue of blood. Jesus, won't you move today in our hearts, God? It's like the father who, whose son needed to be delivered. And Jesus said, you have little faith. Don't you believe? And his cry was, I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. Father, if there's any unbelief in us right now, God, we just lay it down. Father, we just lay down any unbelief that is in us. God, right now, through the power of your spirit, I just pray that you would begin to activate this supernatural, this radical faith, the gift of faith. Won't you stir it in our hearts right now, Jesus? God, that we could see the unseen. God, that we will have a certainty of the things we are hoping for. God, that we will be sure, have the assurance of the things we are hoping for. Not just a belief system, Father. Help us to walk in wisdom and revelation of what you are doing among us, Jesus. God, I just pray right now over everyone under the sound of my voice.
for an activation of divine wisdom, for an activation of the gift of revelation, Father, for an increase in the anointing in their faith right now. Won't you do it in us, Lord? God, won't you prepare us for this season coming up, Father, that we will be radical for you, Jesus. Just posture yourself as to receive. Lord, we receive it now. We receive it by faith. Hey, listen, even if you don't feel anything, if you don't have goosebumps or anything right now, I'm talking about faith. You're seeing the unseen. You don't have to feel him. I know some of you do. Just receive the gift of faith. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to close. I'm excited. I really am. I'm stirred up. I want to see the Lord move, move among us. I really do. Let's step into it. Okay? I pray. Father, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you that you stir in our hearts, God, and you're moving among us, God. And we say, have your will. Have your way, Father. Father, I bless everyone today, God. I pray that they would leave here changed, transformed. I thank you for your touch, for your encounter right now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you, church.